Is it secret? Is it safe? Greetings. Welcome to This, That, and the Other, where I react to, respond to, comment on, question, or otherwise propound on whatever I find of interest on any given day. Now, today's topic Good morning, slash afternoon, slash evening, as appropriate. Here we are at the second episode of my examination of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. If you haven't seen the first episode, you should. It, it tries to explain just what the heck I think I'm doing here. The link's in the description. But as promised, here's the explanation of the place we stopped. You might think about it as the 4th of July, if you're in the US. It's the point where the movies declare their independence from the books. After this, there's a lot of changes. The main concepts, plots, storylines, events, and characters are still here. And above all, the lore is untouched unlike a certain billion dollar abomination that wouldn't recognize lore if it fell on them. However, timelines are changed, plot threads are intertwined, events are modified or eliminated, and secondary characters are eliminated or changed. Sometimes it doesn't matter. But sometimes readers get very annoyed at the liberties taken in the film. And a few large sections of the books are just out and out cut. But as I said before, including everything would require another four hour movie. How many people would want to sit through that? I'm guessing yeah, not more than maybe yeah, 40 or 50 million. But some of those scenes are beloved by many. So some of the con comments may be longer than in the first episode to better explain the changes. And this episode will probably end up being more about uh, what's left out of the movie or uh, majorly changed and less about how reactors react since there's far less to react to. Now, everything from here to Gandalf's scary return to send Frodo on his way takes place over a 17 year span, where Gandalf's visits to the Shire are few, far between, and brief. This shot is just to impress everyone with Sauron's might and Jackson's budget. If you pay attention, you can hear the words Shire and Baggins being squeezed out of Gollum. Gandalf rides to Minas Tirith to research the history of the ring. Now, although this actually happens now in the movie, the reader of the book is not informed of it until the Council of Elrond, a uh, hundred pages from now. The year 3434 of the Second Age. Here follows the account of Zildo, the High King of Gondor, and the finding. A secret now that only fire can tell. In a few minutes of screen time, Gandalf will throw Frodo's ring in the fire. Now, reactions to that range from, I've been saying all along that somebody should destroy it, to, that's not gonna do anything. It's hard to believe that anyone was paying attention back in the prologue when it was just emphasized that only by throwing the ring back in the Mount Doom could it be destroyed. Or maybe they just can't remember that far back or even as far back as Gandalf at the Minas Tirith archives, establishing that fire can reveal the writing. There are a few who figured out what was going on. Good on you. There was no break in and Gandalf's return was calm and peaceful. 
The next six and a half minutes of screen time are only a small portion of the roughly six months before Frodo and company actually left. And none of the action was anywhere near this frantic. So there's the first big change in the storyline. Instead of the intense panic shown, the departure from the Shire was actually calm and orderly and well planned out. Here's the story. A rumor was quietly started that the fabled Baggins' fortune was running low and Frodo was moving back to Buckland where he was raised. He even went so far as to sell Bag End to the dreaded Sackville Bagginses. Plans were made for him to move about the time of his birthday in September. As the day approached, Frodo and his friends, Sam, Mary, Pippin, and Fredegar Bulger, called Fatty by all who knew him, were packing up Frodo's belongings and sending them to his new little house in Crick Hollow in Buckland. Fatty wasn't mentioned at all in the film, as since Frodo wasn't moving to Buckland in the film, he wasn't needed. On the day itself, Mary and Fatty left with the last wagon load. Frodo, Sam, and Pippin uh, took tea. Remember, this was the early 50s Britain. It's the way they talked. Drank a parting toast, grabbed their packs, and took to the road. And to quote the books, they left the washing up for Lobelia, unquote. As they left, they heard a strange voice talking to Sam's gaffer down the hill about Baggins' whereabouts. Apparently, this is what was represented in the movie by the earlier appearance of the Black Rider and the random hobbit woodchopper. Overall, the information presented in the movie was from this section of the book. And there's a lot more that was presented at other places at other times largely background on Gollum. There are many specific lines taken from this section that also showed up later and elsewhere. Many of the more powerful characters throughout the book are tested by the ring, starting here with Gandalf. Take it, Gandalf. Take it. No, Frodo. No. You must take it. You cannot offer me this ring. I'm giving it to you. Don't! Kept me, Frodo. I dare not take it. Not even to keep it safe. Understand, Frodo. I would use this ring from a desire to do good. But through me, it would wield a power too great and terrible to imagine. At least Gandalf hauling Sam in through the window is fairly accurate, except I Ain't Been Dropping No Eaves was originally, I don't follow you, begging your pardon. There ain't no eaves at Bag End, and that's a fact. Jackson, Jackson's line is funnier, but Tolkien's is more Sam-like. I also like Sam hearing well, nothing important, there's something about the end of the world. End of the world's fairly trivial. Mike proceeds much as in the movie, except of course that it's Frodo, Sam, and Pippin. So of course the raid on Farmer Maggot's fields and the fall off the cliff didn't occur. As Sam takes that one step beyond, which also isn't in the book, I love how they dissolve Frodo's voice into Bilbo's. I don't think anyone else noticed. Remember what Bilbo used to say? It's a dangerous business, Frodo. Going out your door, you step onto the road, and if you don't keep your feet, there's no knowing where you might be swept off to. The searching and sniffing black rider comes by here rather than later on. And Sam is reminded therefore, of the exchange between the gaffer and the stranger. Uh, but the rider hastens away when elves begin singing. Ah, elves. 
As usual, there's much more in the book. The hobbits and the elves greet each other and spend a pleasant evening together. They have dinner and the hobbits spend the night in the elves' camp, having long discussions about uh, what's going on in the world. When they awake, the elves have gone, but they've leave, left behind a breakfast for the uh, hobbits. Well, at least a first breakfast. And Gandalf and Saruman's uh, uh, discussion may have happened at about this time, but again, the reader is not informed of it until the Council of Elrond. And this presents me with a philosophical conundrum. Do I relate events when presented in the book or in the movie? Uh, let me think. Well, since this series is ostensibly about the movies, I guess that's the way I have to go. I really don't think that's the most sensible since the books are so much more complete, usually. But this sequence is problematical. Now, this information is from Gandalf's tale, which would be during the council, about a half hour further into the film, but doesn't actually appear there. First, it is not Gandalf's decision to visit Isengard. He meets Radagast on the road near Bree, who tells him Saruman's looking for him. Gandalf asks Radagast for the help of all his animal friends in collecting information about strange goings on and to send that info to him and Saruman in Isengard. Now, Saruman's attitude is much the same in both versions, but the dialogue in the movie is much more arrogant, belittling, and threatening. In the book, he's more of a Bond villain, ominous and bragging. But I guess you ha if you have Christopher Lee, you let him be Christopher Lee. Hey, wait a minute. Christopher Lee was a Bond villain. But there's no epic wizard fight. Gandalf is simply taken to the pinnacle with no further in explanation. And we're not told that Saruman has a palantir. Hobbit stealing crops simply ain't so. However, in the book, in the chapter called A Shortcut to Mushrooms. That was just a detour. A shortcut. A shortcut to what? The mushrooms. See what they did there? There is an episode with Farmer Maggot, a stout fellow, if you leave his mushrooms alone, according to Pippin. Maggot relates an encounter he had earlier with a rider dressed all in black, looking for pagans. Whether it's the same one or there are more of them about is not determined at this point. The hobbits wind up having a nice dinner with the farm household and everyone parts as friends. Maggot even gives them a ride on his wagon to the Buckleberry Ferry where they meet Mary, who had come looking for them. No hiding under a tree with creepy crawlies and no thrilling black rider chase. Sorry. However, since those scenes are in the movie, the reactions are as expected, squeamishness about the bare feet is still 50 pages away. But in the meantime, the travelers arrive in Crick Hollow and spend a quiet, comfy evening while Frodo struggles with how to break the news to his friends that he would be leaving. The other four watch him squirm and then, <laughs> then reveal that they've known all about his plans for some time now. They had all noticed some strange disappearances of Frodo and started watching him more closely, learning something of the ring. And Sam was observing a lot more and reporting it. We now come to one of the truly major omissions, the Old Forest, Tom Bombadil, Barrow Downs chapters. Now, I think it's fair to say that Tolkien's storytelling 
adaptive abilities really shift into high gear in this section. Since there's no actual action, a firm command of language is necessary. His early years as a poet gave him the tools. My hatchet job summary is almost an insult. You really need to read the original. Of course, you really need to read the entire saga anyway. I'll hit the high points as best I can. Okay, boys and girls, let's all gather around the fire while Uncle, Uncle Jeffy tells you a story about four little hobbits and their adventures in the creepy old forest, the bright and cheerful house of the inexplicable Tom Bombadil, and the foggy, dark, and scary Barrow Downs. Now one day, the hobbits Frodo, Sam, Mary, and Pippin left their comfy homes in the Shire to deliver a magic ring to a mighty lord of the elves in a faraway country. They started on their way by walking down a path into the old forest, which lay just outside the Shire. The forest was ancient beyond belief and was thought by some to be a remnant of a much larger forest, which covered the hundreds and of thousands of square miles. Some even thought it was haunted. Probably wasn't, but the strange things did happen there. The air was still and stifling, and the eerie atmosphere drove the hobbits deeper and deeper into the Withy Windle River Valley, no matter which way they attempted to go. Eventually, because of the impressive, oppressive heat and stillness of the air, they stopped for a rest. Frodo went down to the river to cool his feet off. Sam wandered off looking for their ponies, while Mary and Pippin lay down against the trunk of an old willow tree. Now Sam returned quickly when he heard a series of strange noises. Frodo had fallen into the river, saying that a tree had pushed him in. Mary and Pippin were caught in cracks in the tree's trunk. Frodo became panicking and was yelling for help although he knew no one was nearby. His calls, though, were answered by, and I quote from the book, a man, or so it seemed. At any rate, he was too large and heavy for a hobbit, if not quite tall enough for one of the big people. That's us. Though he made enough noise for one, stomping along with great yellow boots and on his thick legs, and charging through the grass and the rushes like a cow going down to drink. He had a blue coat and a long brown beard. His eyes were blue and bright. And his face was red as a ripe, ripe apple, but creased into a hundred wrinkles of laughter. None other than Tom Bombadil. I'm not even going to attempt to understand or explain who or what Tom Bombadil is. There's a couple of links below if you want to know, and you should. He handled Old Man Willow masterfully, releasing Mary and Pippin from his clutches with the exact same words Treebeard used much later in the story in the same situation. You should not be waking. Eat earth, dig deep, drink water, Go to sleep. Tom takes the hobbits home with him, capering all the way. Caper is such a great word, meaning roughly half walking, half dancing, half skipping, half singing songs with nonsense words. We need more of that these days. At the house, the hobbits meet Tom's lady, Goldberry, daughter of the river, whatever that means. They rested and were fed more than once, but, quote, whether the morning and evening of one day or many days passed, Frodo could not tell, unquote. 
Now they had many discussions with Tom about just about everything, but couldn't learn anything about him. But he put them so at ease that they sometimes talked about things they shouldn't, like, uh, you know what. Tom suddenly asked to see the ring, toyed with it a while, and, and put it on. The Hobbes were startled to see that he did not vanish. Soon it was time for the travelers to be on their way. Tom counseled the hobbits to keep, uh, keep to the road and not to go meddling with the barrow downs. But he taught them a rhyme to sing if they ran into any trouble. The hob hobbits start traveling away from Tom's house, following his directions skirting the Barrow Downs. They made good time at first, but eventually a fog was descending on the valley and uh, they soon became separated and lost, uh, lost their way. Frodo began to call out for the others, but he only heard vague sounds in return. It was getting dark and cold, an icy wind was blowing. A tall figure leaned over him and he lost consciousness. When he began to recover, he found himself inside one of the barrels, lying on the cold floor. As his eyes adjusted, he spied Sam, Mary, and Pippin lying unconscious near him, with a long sword lying across their necks. You know, I really can't describe the rest of the scene without resorting to long quotes of Tolkien's magnificent prose. But needless to say, things were not going well. Then Frodo started to remember the rhyme Tom taught him before they left. He started singing it. As he sang, his voice grew stronger. Before long, he heard Tom's voice singing in return. And as I'm sure you expected, Tom put everything right. It took a while to get it all together, uh, the ponies having wandered away with all their gear. Tom took the time to explain the situation with the barrels and the ancient kingdom that existed there long, long ago. And from the treasure trove in the barrel, he outfitted the hobbits with, quote, old knives, long enough as swords for hobbit people, unquote. Now these swords came from the barrel, not from Aragorn on Weathertop, as others have told. We don't even know, we don't even find out where he supposedly got them from. Tom did reveal the blades were made by the men of Westerness, that is, the Dunedain, and foreshadowed, quote, few now remember them, yet still some go wandering, sons of forgotten kings, guarding from evil things folks that are heedless, unquote. Remember that, it'll help you later. They continued on their journey with Tom accompanying them for a while, but he finally turned back when they reached the borders of his country because, quote, Tom has his house to mind and Goldberry is waiting, unquote. Before riding off, however, he suggested the hobbits stay at the Prancing Pony in Bree. Now, Gandalf never actually said anything about that. <clears throat> Now, when he told the story, Uncle Peter seemed to have suggested that the hobbits travel directly from the ferry to Bree. But we know better now, don't we? As you can tell, there aren't more than maybe a couple of sentences that actually relate to the main story. So plot-wise, yeah, this can all be dumped. But fans love Bombadil so much, they almost take his omission personally. 
and yes, I do feel a little embarrassed about this, but unless you can tell a story as well as Professor Tolkien and himself, it's going to be a bit dry. I just tried to add a little entertainment value to maintain interest. Well, we're running a bit over here, so I'll have to just say thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.